If it's uh, good afternoon, on behalf of the county commissioners, I want to thank each one of you uh, valued stakeholders for coming out to be part of this important uh, process as Ray Freeman Communications Consulting uh, begins to conduct a refresh of the 2008 GEOCOM study that was completed back in 2008. Through the hard work and co cooperation of really everybody in this room, uh, that study and the result and re resulting recommendations of the study in 2008 really have served as a foundation and a roadmap uh, for major improvements in public safety in Stark County over the last 11 years. I think you all would agree with that. So before Ray and Paul, Ray Freeman and Paul and A, who is doing a reprise from his uh, debut, uh, 2007 and 8, uh, again here with us, uh, before they introduce themselves to you, uh, I'd like to ask for their benefit if each one of you would introduce yourselves, your agency, and your title, uh, so they can know who's in the room and who they're talking to, if you could. Derek Loy, Stark County Sheriff's Office uh, Administrator. Uh, George Meyer, Stark County Sheriff. Uh, Richard Reggio, Stark County Commissioner. Bill Smith, Stark County Commissioner. Jana Creighton, Stark County Commissioner. Carol Anderson, Interoperable Communication Specialist for Sheriff Mayor. Mm -hmm. Tom Brooks, Chief. Uh, Cody Post, soon to be the new executive director of the Red Center. Doug Wood, Deputy Director, Stark County EMA. Michael Garian, Sergeant Alliance Police Dispatch Supervisor. Uh, Mike Jarvis, Alliance Service Director. Mark Foster, Stark County uh, IT. Kim Orso, Stark County EMA. Andrea Perry, Interoperable Stark County Sheriff. Uh, Jeff Hansen, and Julia Patterson, 911 coordinator for Stark County, that has lost her voice. And we'll use that rubber today. Well, uh, as Brent said, good evening. I'm Ray Freeman, uh, Ray Freeman Communications Consulting, a former GeoCom employee. And uh, I'm here with Paul and A today, and, and uh, he'll talk about himself a little bit. And uh, uh, GeoCom came under new ownership in 2013, and they got rid of the consulting unit. and. Uh, some of us went out on our own, and some people retired. And uh, so uh, we were contacted by Stark County and asked uh, if we'd be interested in coming back and revisiting the 2008 PSAP study. So I called Paul, and uh, he said, oh, I remember it well. And, uh, and so we appreciate the opportunity to come back here and work on this project. Uh, I'm based out of the Minneapolis area, Paul is as well. So uh, we enjoy coming back down here again, we're making many more trips um, as we talk about it through our presentation. We have a fairly brief presentation. There's only about 10 or 11 slides here with some information, some questions, and it's the intent here to, to get some dialogue going um, at the same time as letting you all know what our plans are uh, on this project. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thanks, boss. Uh, years ago, I was original, so this is an interesting <laughs> I uh, have to begin by saying, I have a, as you said, I'm retired. And along with being retired, I have a certain physical condition. I have a lung condition, which means if I talk too loud or talk too long, and those of you who know me know that that's highly likely, um, <laughs> I will get short of breath and I will start coughing and maybe if, it's, if you're lucky, I'll pass off. So in order to avoid that, I've got a device called an oxygen concentrator. And I'll wear this and you won't hear it, but it'll keep you from Going, what's that phrase? Belly up? So, here we go. All right. Slide one. First off, we reintroduced the 2008 study team. I was the lead consultant on the project here that started in late 2007, ran through the calendar year of 2008, and wrapped up in the early portions of 2009. I had ongoing contact after that with a fellow by the name of Joe Cacato, who was retained by SCOG to implement some of the uh, recommendations of the 2008 report. And uh, Joe even traveled up to the Twin Cities on at least one occasion uh, and visited a dispatch center that I had recommended to him in a place called Dakota County, Minnesota, which was kind of a model of what I thought Stark County could end up being. And uh, I introduced him to those folks and spent some time with him then and had some communication with them uh, for a couple years thereafter. Now, I'm led to believe that Joe is now retired and is no longer intimately involved with the project, 
Uh, maybe I'll see him walk down the road. Maybe we'll chat. I would like to talk to him and get his view on some of the things that have happened over the years. Um, okay, next, next item. Uh, review of the process and the outcome. The study process that was employed in, back in 2008 was uh, the same kind of process that I have employed in about 50 other jurisdictions around the USA that range in size from the city of Atlanta and Fulton County, Georgia, to Long Beach, California, to all kinds of mid-sized entities around the U.S., mostly in the Midwest, to actually a handful of really small, we like to refer to them as one holder county operations and like the state of Iowa that has 99 counties in that little state. Some of those counties are pretty small and it's not, unlike, it's not unlikely to find a county where there is a sheriff and two deputies in fire district. <laughs> So with that, there are many times that the only county employee on duty is the dispatcher in the dispatch center. The sheriff's home in bed, deputy one's home in bed, deputy two's home in bed, all the firemen are volunteer firemen. There's no city police in any cities in the county, and that dispatcher is it, and he's the one on duty. So if something happens, you're in trouble, he has to call somebody out to help you. So that's the range of experience I've had in these. And as I was telling the sheriff and a few others in an earlier meeting today, if you were to go back to those 50 entities that I have done these studies for, and if you were to ask them, how many of you did what that smart guy Lene recommended that you do? Um, I would estimate that the answer you'd get would be maybe 10 out of the 50 would say, you know, we did some of it, didn't do it all. The rest of it would say, didn't do much of it. Some of it has happened naturally in the decades or so since then, but we didn't follow too many of the recommendations, and the answer they gave you was, and with a small p, politics. We couldn't get people to agree on who ought to do it, who ought to pay for it, who ought to be in charge of it, whose name ought to go on the door, and so on and so forth. So Stir County is faced with uh, an environment that is not dramatically different than what one sees throughout, well, there's 3,067 counties in the U.S., and I would estimate that at least 1,500 of those counties either are doing, have done, or should do what Stir County is doing. Um, but not all of them are, don't, don't mistake that. Now, there are a couple of states Ohio was one of them. Indiana and Illinois were more aggressive than this. They passed laws. The state government, state legislature said, we think there are too many 911 dispatch centers in our state. We're going to pass a law saying that no county shall have more than X. Or that was the case in Indiana. No county shall have more than two. And Ray worked on a project in Lake County, Indiana, which was Hammond, or uh, Hammond is there, Gary. and Gary, we all know Gary, just east of Chicago, beautiful downtown Gary, and um, they, they walked in the door, 17 dispatchers in Lake County, 17 911 centers. They, they walked out of the door, two. Do you think everybody in Lake County was happy on the day they walked out of the door? Nope. Do they think, you think everybody in Lake County is happy today? Nope. Is it working? Yep. So this is not an easy process. How did we get to this process? I'd like to begin the timeline back about 1950. In 1950, just after World War II, if you were to park all of the fire trucks, police cars, sheriff's cars, and ambulances in Stark County out in the parking lot, and you were to take an inventory of all those vehicles, not many of them, certainly not all of them, would have had two-way radios. Some of them might have had one-way radios. None of them had anything that we know of today as a walkie-talkie, something like this. I mean, that was a pipe dream back in 1950. Now, fortunately, or unfortunately, some of the technological advancements that occurred in World War II caused for the growth of the little company by the name of Motorola, which started selling all sorts of stuff. And lo and behold, by the end of the 1950s, everybody had walkie-talkies. Not walkie-talkies, everybody had two-way radios. By the late 60s to the mid-1970s, people started getting walkie-talkies. 
and this business of public safety communications began to grow. Back in 1950, I can pretty much guarantee you, if you, this was not the sheriff's building in 1950, but had it been, if you would have walked in this front door in 1950 and you would have asked to see the dispatcher, the party you would have seen probably was the party who was also the jailer. And there would be that one party, and that one party would have a telephone on his or her, his is probably. And that one party might have a rudimentary radio microphone on his desk that might be connected to a one-way radio transmitter. And that one party also served as the sheriff's secretary during the daytime office. That was the, that was the dispatcher of 1950. By the time we got to the 1960s, it tended to be dedicated dispatchers. By the time we get to the 1970s and 80s, it tended to be more of a specialized thing because computers came. And probably the worst people on computers is a bunch of old cops and firemen back then. They had to hire people who knew how to take. And a bunch, I was one of them. I've been in, I was a cop at the beginning of 1970. And uh, if you would have asked me to take anything in 1970, you would have had a world of hurt. So this industry and this business has changed dramatically. The one thing that I think has changed it more than anything else was two things. Right? Thing number one was 911. Introduced originally in 1969 in, of all places, a little podunk town down in the state of Alabama. A place called Haleyville, Alabama was the first 911 system. And it was what was called basic 911. And what that meant was any telephone connected to the telephone company central office in Haleyville, Alabama, city of about 500 people, any telephone connected to that, and all telephones were connected to that, that dialed 911, that call would ring in to the Haleyville police. Department. That was 911. From that, it took from 1969 until 1976 for a new technology to come along called Enhanced 911. And Enhanced 911 created the environment, the opportunity to have the environment we have today. And in 1976, Enhanced 911 meant three key elements. Element number one, a feature known as automatic number identification. Today, we're all used to caller ID. Back then, that was rocket science. And with automatic number identification, the calling the, nine, the party calling 911, their telephone number would display for the answer. But back then, there was no such thing as caller ID in the civilian world. So this was wonderful to have that number. Number two, automatic location information. When the dispatcher answered the 911 call, that telephone number that came with the call that was displayed would be zapped away to the telephone company database. And the telephone company database would be asked, who does this phone number belong to? And the database would come back and say, well, that phone number is registered to and paid for by Ray Freeman. And his address is 13517 Larkin Drive, Minnetonka, Minnesota. And their police department is the Minnetonka Police Department. The fire department is in Minnetonka. The fire department and their ambulance service is the Hennepin County Medical Center Ambulance Service. Isn't that wonderful? Dispatcher had much more information than they ever had before, so that if the caller couldn't talk or hung up or got disconnected, the dispatcher still knew where the call was coming from and could still send help. That was the number one thing that happened in the past 50 years in this business. The number two thing was not nearly as well planned. And it's also the fault of Motorola. And that is cell phones. The first cell phone service commercially went available in 1984. And in 1984, Motorola went to the FCC and asked, can we have licenses to implement cellular telephone service in the U.S.? And the FCC said, sure, go ahead. What the FCC didn't say, and they should have said, was before we say yes or no, what are you going to do about 911? How is that going to work, guys? Never asked the question. So they started putting in cellular telephony. They put it in Chicago first, then around the country in the major metropolitan areas. I was one of the first purchasers of a cell phone for a sergeant's car in the police department I worked in in 1984. Put that cell phone in the car. It's one of the big ones. It cost about 3000 bucks. And I sat in the garage at the fire station where I was putting it in. And I thought to myself, what happens if I call 911? Now this fire station garage was in the same, it was in the city hall complex. And in that same complex was our police dispatch. So I figured when I dialed 911, 
We had an Einstein one. We've had it for two years. I figured, well, my dispatcher, the people who work for me, they're going to answer. <laughs> so I dialed 911. Rings a couple times. You know, remember, I work, you know, I should say, remember, you know, was, at that time I worked in the city of Richfield, Minnesota. And uh, I expected the dispatcher to say, Richfield 911. Ding a ling ling, ding a ling ling. Bloomington 911. That's what the call got answered. I said, Bloomington. Why are you answering me? I'm in Richfield. And they say, why are you calling me? I'm in Bloomington. <laughs> I said, I don't know. I hung up and I started looking. And here's what happened. Back then, there were only two cell, cell, cell companies in the USA. Well, in any given market in the USA, there were only two cell companies. One of them was part of the existing telephone company in that market. The other one was supposed to be a competitor. Well, we bought ourselves one from the competitor, outfit called MCI. Do you remember them? They went bankrupt from that outfit, Enron and all those other people back in the 80s. MCI was a cellular service company. That was who our cell phone was with. They had our, all of their towers around the metropolitan area, but all of those towers were fed into one place. That one place is called their mobile switching office. And then that one place is where the calls got routed either up to other MCI phones if I was calling my buddy who had no phone. Or the calls were routed out to the seven digit number of my house that I was calling, or the seven digit number of the business that I was calling, or the 911. But when they got routed to 911, where did 911 think the call was coming from? They thought it was coming from the location of that MCI mobile switching center, which happened to be located, guess what? In Bloomington, Minnesota the suburb immediately adjacent to the one I lived in and worked in, Richfield. So that's why the Bloomington police got the call. Because it looked to them, it looked to the 911 network like I was calling Bloomington. Because the call originated at this MCI mobile switching center in Bloomington, Minnesota. The other side of the house, the uh, our phone company back then was Northwestern Bell, and Northwestern Bell had their competitor service. Their mobile switching center was in downtown Minneapolis. Consequently, any 911 call from anywhere from the middle of western Wisconsin out to halfway to North Dakota, any 911 call placed from any of those places on a Northwestern Bell cell phone was answered in the Minneapolis 911 center. You think the Minneapolis 911 center wanted those calls? Not on your way. All right, one thing leads to another. And by about 1998, the cellular telephone industry take two big steps. And big step number one is they got permission from the FCC to expand dramatically by adding what are known as personal communication services. Those of you of a certain age can remember commercials. They're an outfit called Sprint PCS. You can hear a pin drop. PCS is important because it was an entirely different technology than the cellular telephone. That technology by law, by FCC regulation, had to be digital as opposed to analog, which is what the old cell phones were. Because they were digital, the devices didn't need to be as big because they didn't need to have as big a battery. Because the devices didn't need to be as big, they could begin miniaturizing the cell phone devices. Anybody remember the Motorola Razor? It was about as flat as a credit card at about the same size. Then there were other companies, Nokia made some really little ones. I remember a cell phone literally the size of today's iPod Nano. Literally half the size of a cigarette pack. And they could do this because they were digital. You know what this meant? Cell phones were no longer bolted in. Lincolns and Cadillacs being driven by drug dealers, lawyers, and cops. They were now in the back pocket of everything. And that meant that everybody going everywhere was seeing stuff. And when they saw stuff, they wanted to report it. So they'd whip out the cell phone, they'd dial 911, and they'd tell them about that accident at the corner of walk and don't walk in downtown Warrior. How many other people were reporting that accident at the corner of walk and don't walk in downtown Warrior? 15, 20? How many calls did the downtown wherever police dispatch center need to report that accident? One. How many did they get? 15. Did they want them all? No. Could they ignore the other 14? No. Because number seven in that bunch could have been an enable with a heart attack. You got to answer them all. So the call volume increased dramatically. Pretty soon people began to realize that, gee, the cell phone, not only does it work good, but I'm off the ball. It works in my house. 
well, why am I sending that bill every month back in the day to Ameritech for 35, 45, 50 bucks for my home phone line when I got a cell phone? But not only does it work good, guess what? Free long distance. You didn't get free long distance on your landline back then. So people started canceling their landline service. And all they ended up with was, in the beginning, one cell phone in the household. Then two, then three, then four, then five. And now we have where the problem comes in. Landline telephone, as I indicated early on when I was talking about enhanced 911, landline telephones can be selectively routed to the dispatch center deemed to be appropriate or the address from which the call is being placed, the street address from which the call is being placed. And this can be done down to a very, very narrow level of granularity. You could have a given block, and on this given block, there could be three houses. The house on the north end of the block is in the city of X. The house on the south end of the block is in the city of Y. The house in the middle of the block is in the unincorporated area of county, whatever. The south end house landline call can go to the city of X 911 PC. The north end house landline call can go to the city of Y 911 PC. And the 911 call from the middle of the house coming from the unincorporated area of the county can go to the sheriff's department 911 PC. That is the level at which you can do selective routing on landline calls. Now, cell phone doesn't work that way. From the beginning, and up through today and into the foreseeable future. Cellular 911 calls are and will be routed by the cell site and sector of origination of the call. So if you look at any given, I think most of you know what a cell tower looks like, and if you look up towards the top, in the simplest sense, in the one out in the middle of the country, you're gonna see a triangular platform at the top, and on that triangular platform there are three vertical white things on each side. A total of nine around the whole thing, but three facing, let's say, north, three facing southeast, three facing southwest. Each of those three different faces is a sector. So think of that tower as really being three towers. One tower covers the area north of the tower, one tower covers the area southeast of the tower, one tower covers the area southwest of the tower. So if I'm calling 911 from an area southwest of the tower, Logically, my call is going to be received by and processed by the antennas facing my direction, the southwest facing bank of antennas. And that bank of antennas can be programmed, or the radio is connected to it, can be programmed to send that call to a certain 911 PSAP based on my location. The one over in the southeast can go to the same PSAP or another PSAP, it doesn't matter. It can be programmed to go wherever you want it to go. It can be programmed to go to the PSAP in Fargo, North Dakota, even though the tower is in Stark County, Ohio. It could be done. Why you do it, I don't know. Then the one facing north can go to yet another PSAP. Now, the problem with that is the piece of land covered by this bunch of antennas that are facing southwest, if you're out in the rural area, not in a core downtown urban area, if you're out in a rural area, the pie slice formed by that triangle is somewhere in the vicinity of 15 to 20 miles deep. And at the outer edge, you know, the curved line that would be at the end of the pie slice, at that outer edge, it might be 35 miles across. How many square miles are in that pie slice? Lots. And the higher the antenna, the bigger the pie slice. Now, if you put it in a downtown urban area, on the top of a three-story building, that would only make it, say, 45 feet off the ground. The pie slice would be quite a bit smaller. The smaller the pie slice is, the more refined the routing can be. But for this refined routing to be effective, the, the individuals at the 911 dispatch centers who answer them have to be intimately involved with all seven cell phone service providers that could be providing service in a given area, because all seven of them have their own sets of towers, and even if they're on the same tower, there are different elevations on the same tower, so they have different sized heights. So ideally, somebody at the dispatch center sits down with the people from AT&T Wireless, let's say, and looks at all of these maps from all these towers 
the maps. So let's see if they were all printed and brand new and accurate as of this morning. So look at all these maps, figuring out what pieces of land are within this ice lease. What part of it is, this is the city of Canton? What part of it is the unorganized part of the, part of the county? What part of, part of this is the city of Massillon and the village or township? All of those sorts of things. And based on the answers to those questions, they have to arrive at one decision for that one sector. Where should this one sector be wrong? And I guarantee you, whatever decision they come up with is going to be wrong on day one, out of the box, minimum 25% of the time. They can't be right 100% of the time because there's multiple jurisdictions within that isolate. So they make the best guess they can, and then they hope like heck that next month, when AT&T adds another tower down the block, and therefore comes back in the first tower and adjusts things and raises things and lowers things and adjusts the, trans the tuning on there and changes the pie slice, that at and calls them up and tells them that. So they can update their routing decision. It is exceedingly problematic as it, it is at best a crapshoot as to whether or not it all turns out right. So what is the net effect of all of this? Many, many, many 911 calls are answered at the place that is not the appropriate place for the calls to be answered based on what the caller is reporting and from where they're reporting. Nobody's fault, except maybe the FCC, except maybe Motorola, but it's certainly not the fault of Skirt County, it's certainly not the fault of anybody in this room. That's life, it's the cards we've been dealt with. So, if that is a true fact, and if there are multiple dispatch centers to which these calls could be wrong, what is the obvious answer to the problem? Well, an answer could be fewer places to route calls. And I have a, this is a ridiculous example, but it makes the point. I have another example I have a nature. Where I could build a 911 call center on the banks of the Missouri River in Kansas City, Missouri. Those banks that have nice limestone caves in them, they're naturally cool, they're a great place to put a 911 call center. And I could staff a thousand people around the clock. And I could answer every 911 call in the USA. Not one of them would have gone to the wrong 911 center, would they? Because there's only one. You can't be wrong if there's only one. That would be uh, economical. But would it be operationally effective or logical? I don't think so. I don't think a 911 operator sitting in a cave on the banks of the Missouri River in Kansas City has enough situational and geographic awareness of what's happening across the state of Missouri, much less in Stark County, Ohio. So if, if that's the ridiculous extreme over there, the other ridiculous extreme over here is in a county, for example, in fact, I know well of a county in east suburban St. Louis. It's in Illinois County by Illinois, Madison County, Illinois. It's right across the river from the St. Louis Arch in downtown St. Louis. And in Madison County, Illinois, when I did the study down there, the day we walked in the door, this county of 140,000 people. The day we walked in the door, you know how many 911 centers there were in the county? 27. Do you know how many there are today? It's on the way down to 22. Why? Because the state of Illinois mandated it. But they cut that number from 27 to not greater than half of 27 eventually. They got a few waivers of the state in the meantime, that's why they're not there yet. But those are kind of the two extremes. Stark County is somewhere in the middle. And the question is, is it being done as it ought to be done, or is it best can be done in Stark County today? That is what we looked at in 2008. The changes of the code from 2008, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the objectives for today, the process we're going to follow, and the schedule. Next slide. So that's me, that's Ray. Ray's my boss and I'm Mr. Peasby. Uh, he's got all the money in the world. Uh, what were the outcomes? We, we need to learn what the results of the work were in 2008. What has changed since 2008? It is our understanding, correct us if we're wrong here, it is our understanding that in 2008, there were 10 police and fire dispatch centers in Stark County. And there are now seven. What hasn't changed? And should it have changed? That's what we want to learn. Who in this meeting today has read our 2008 report? 
any of you have. I, it's probably kind of dry reading, I can understand that, but uh, it might be good background. And we have copies available. Our contact info is up here. We can send you an electronic copy of the report if you want it, and you can read it. The things we need to confirm. The number of dispatch centers, I guess it was 11, was reduced from 11 down to 7. I use this term dispatch centers here with two asterisks behind it. Because there's really two animals on two different kinds of animals. Kind of animal number one is technically referred to as a 911 public safety answering plan, abbreviated as a, a 911 PSAP. That's animal number one. That is a place where 911 calls are answered, and in most cases for two way radio dispatching of police at a minimum, and also fire and EMS. Sometimes there's also. The other one is a place that does not directly answer 911 calls, but receives information passed on to them, usually in the form of a 911 call transferred to them, and they receive those calls, and that's a dispatch center, but they're not part of the 911 network, 911 telephone network. That's why I draw that distinction. We also understand that the county commissioners in Stark County have contracted with the sheriff to reduce the number of 911 call transfers. But we came here in 2008, in the basement of this building, there was a small room with a handful of people on duty, and the job of those people was to answer all 911 calls dialed within Stark County, except for those dialed within the city of Canada. And all cellular 911 calls from all over Stark County. Those people down in that room had no ability to talk on two-way radios to police cars, fire trucks, or ambulances. Their job was to take the call and serve as what we call a neutral piece of neutral meaning they were neither police nor fire nor ambulance. And they would, based on what the caller was saying, they would transfer the call to what they believed to be the appropriate response agency's dispatch center for the address from which the party was called. That function has now been, I won't say eliminated, but uh, yeah, it has been eliminated and that the work that they were doing that work is now being done under contract by dispatchers in the sheriff's call center, where they also do radio dispatching of a number of yes. response agencies. So that's happened. We understand that the police dispatch operations in Louisville, Perryville, and Plain, Plain Township are no longer in operation. We understand that there's a new countywide computer-aided dispatch system and that it is available for all facilities and events, facilities meaning agencies and events. But I think we've gotten the indication that not everybody is using it. It's there, it's available, but it isn't all being used by everybody. We have learned that the recommendations we had for upgrading and expanding and, and increasing the participation in the countywide 800 megahertz trunk radio system that did exist back in 08 but is now vastly modified since then, it has been done, and that radios and the ability and opportunity to use them have been provided for everyone. But not everyone is using them as their routine method of communication. Does anybody want to disagree with any of the things we think we know? Next. What don't we know that you think we need to? Anybody want to offer anything? Based on what you've seen thus far, do we have a fairly accurate picture of what's happening today? Structure. Next one. What major problems or deficiencies were identified in OE? Well, clearly the number one, way, way, way far above everything else, was the number of 911 couples being transferred. It was off the charts. And it's gotten worse in some respects because the percentage of 911 calls coming in from cell phones versus those coming in from landlines has increased in the last 10 years, even above what it was in 2008. So that is probably a major deficiency. And of course, what that resulted in is if the, dispatch, if the call goes to the wrong place, it's got to be transferred. Sometimes it has to be transferred twice. And it is my, it's a rule of thumb in my mind, at least, that the more times you transfer a 911 call, the less happy the caller is, and the greater the likelihood of something going wrong is. So to the extent that all of those are bad, reducing those number of transfers would be a good thing in my opinion. 
next. Looking forward, what do you folks think needs to happen? And this is probably the most important. What do you hope doesn't happen? What, you know, I, I'm guessing that one of the reasons not all of the recommendations we made in our 2008 report, which by the way, we did recommend in the report that it was conceivable, it was viable, it was, would be cost effective for there to be one 911 call taking dispatch center from Stark Town. So, given the fact that that was our recommendation and it isn't there yet, what needs to happen? But the fact that it hasn't happened tells us some people don't think it should happen. Why? Are we missing something? Is there some bit of knowledge or information or operational practices out there that we are not aware of that would change the equation that led us to believe that what ought to happen is there ought to be one? So that's what we'd like to hear. If you have an answer to the question, what do you hope doesn't happen, let us know. What areas do you think we ought to focus on? You know, in some places where I go or have gone in the past, I hear things like, oh, we can't do any of this because we have terrible radio reception. The people out in the valley can never hear us talking to them. That's our big problem. Well, that problem apparently has been solved here, and I guess it's even going to get better because of the addition of a bunch of repeaters to the trunk radio system in the near future. Uh, some places I hear, wow, the problem is we got a bunch of slugs working for us as dispatchers. They're, they're as dumb as bricks. Every fourth call they get, they screw it up. What we need is better people, better training. Nobody's told me that about Stark County. If you believe that to be the case, now is the time to raise it. Because the provision of training, the provision of supervision, are all things that need to be factored into what would it cost to have a consolidated dispatch center. If you have a consolidated dispatch center where you care not one whit about training anybody, then you don't have to build any money in the budget for people away from their workstation while they get trained. If you care not one whit about people having the ability to take time off, you don't have to build that into the budget, so on and so forth. So to the extent that these are factors, we need to hear about them because they need to go into the equation of what should the staffing of such an entity go by. Next, project objectives. I want to stress this one extremely strong. To collect solid data, information, opinions, and observations that fully assess the status of today's 911 call answering and dispatch services in the following areas. At least the following areas. Operations, call volumes, and traffic levels, staffing, training, and supervisory levels, technical capabilities, whatever the deficiencies are, and how much is being spent to do it. Next. Objectives to develop data-based, I stress data-based, forward-looking recommendations for the Board of County Commissioners to support their decision making. I'm going to tell you a little story out of school. Um, I was contacted a month or so ago by Tim. And uh, in fact, I think I contacted Tim. I said, I'd like to see or have some input into the invite that goes out to this meeting tonight. And so Tim said, well, sure, go ahead. So I started writing. And when I sat down, I was totally unfiltered. I said to myself, I'm going to write what I would like to see go on. I don't know if the commissioners are going to like this. I don't know if the sheriff's going to like it, but I'm going to like it. Now, once they, once Tim gets it and he ships it around to various people, they can cut it up, they can mark it up, they can throw it out. That's up to them. But here's what I'd like to see go on. So I submitted that writing, page one or so. And the other day, I got a copy from Tim of what did go on, the letter you all saw. I was shocked. It was almost word for word what I wrote. What that tells me is these folks here, the three county commissioners, are telling me, be honest, be objective, be fair, tell us what you think is right. Don't sugarcoat it, don't tilt it in our, to where you think it, we want it to be, tell us the truth. And most important, the paragraph I put in there, where I said, I don't remember it, but it was kind of a long rambling paragraph about how so many decisions in, in public government today are being made on the basis of other than hard data. 
they're being made because somebody's got a gut feeling that thus and such isn't right. Or somebody thinks it's not nice if we do thus and such. Or wouldn't it be cool if we could do X, Y, and Z? None of that is hard data. Let's deal with facts. And if we develop as many facts as we can in this process, I think the facts are going to drive this train down to where it ought to arrive at the end. How will the work be performed? We're going to identify and create contact information for all 911 call centers and their managers. That begins today. Ray is going to hand off um, a show of hands here. There's seven operating entities in the county today. Are all seven? Is there anybody here from Red Center? Okay, you'll take one. And what we want on there is the name, a phone number, an email address of the county, the, looks, I think the official word will be the cognizant contact person at the Red Center for whom we will hold responsible for giving us data. So we've got the Red Center, we've got Canton, we've got what area over here? Alliance. Alliance PD. Well, we've got sheriff's the sheriff's office. office, there's four. Anybody from the two other three? We have two left? Two left. We'll figure out three. three. Oh. Okay. So we've got three left. We'll, we'll get, get the information <coughs> from We need to know who, quite frankly, who to call at 3 in the morning when we're not getting the information we want. Maybe 3 in the morning is right. Maybe it'll be 2 in the morning. Nobody or maybe needs. whose name I will give to Brent or to the sheriff to say, guess what? They're not giving us any data. I'm going to push real hard on this because if we don't get this data, this is going to be a waste of time. So develop a schedule for future site visits by consulting team. We plan on doing two site visits per day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and we're going to do them in the period of November and December, and it'll either be one trip into the county or two trips. We haven't figured that out yet. We're going to prepare and distribute comprehensive data collection instruments for use. First thing we're going to do is develop the draft, and we're going to field test it on one or more of you people whose contact info we're getting today. We're going to send you this document, and we're going to say, here are the questions we'd like to ask you. We're not asking you the questions. We're just saying, here's the questions we'd like to ask you. Do they make sense? Do you understand what we are asking for? Is what we are asking for knowable? We're not asking you if you know it, but is it knowable in your organization? It's only through that mechanism that we can assure that nobody's not answering item X on the data collection form because they didn't understand. We want everybody to understand. Once it's been field tested for understandability, we'll establish a deadline for submission. Then we'll determine who to contact in case of non-submittal or incomplete information. Here's where my 3 a.m. phone call comes in. Then we'll distribute the data collection form. Next slide. Then, once the forms come back into it, we will compile the data and develop an accurate picture of the 911 and dispatch services in the county today. We will then take that data and present it to hopefully a slightly larger version of this group, a, a, a version that includes the three entities that aren't here today. We will present that data and we'll say to you, okay folks, these are the pictures you sent to us of what you look like at your place. And we're putting it back on you and saying, did we get it right? Is this what you told us about your operation? If the answer to that question is no, you need to raise your hand and say, no, this, this column over here where you counted this kind of widget, we didn't mean that kind of widget. We meant the other kind of widget. We have to get that clarified at that point. But at the end of that session, I hope to be able to walk out of the room with agreement from everyone that what we're going forward with is an accurate, complete, and thorough picture of what's happening in Stark County today in the realm of 911 and dispatch services. Then, using those agreed data elements, we'll set about the process of writing the report. And the report's conclusions will be driven by the data that we have collected. We will then provide a draft of the report to the county project team, which will be Tim, Brad and the commissioners. There are the people who retired, who turned, not retired, retained us. And we'll give it to them for their review. And um, it's up to them what they want to say about the review. Next. 
Here's the schedule we think in which we think this will happen. We have today's meeting. We're going to develop the data collection forum to review and adopt them at the next meeting. Uh, that has to be determined. We would like that next meeting to take place not later than October 31st. So that's within the next month. And um, I don't know, I was thinking we ought to come up with a meeting date today, but I think maybe working with Tim, we can throw around a few ideas over the next week or so and come up with one in the not too distant future. Item three, we're going to distribute the approved data collection instruments, and that will occur not later than November 15th. Then we're going to conduct site visits in the period that end not later than November, correct, December 13th. Then we'll receive the completed data collection instruments, not later than January 31. Key point, this is 31 days after the end of everybody's fiscal year. So it would be our hope that the data collection form you submit will in fact reflect 2019 year-end data. How much money did you spend? How many calls did you get? How many dispatches did you use? So on and so forth. So we're looking at the most current full year of data. Then we have a group meeting to review and accept that data. Then we deliver the draft report to the, oh, that's by March 15. Then we review and deliver the draft report to the commissioners by April 15. Then the commissioners react and send their reaction comments to us by not later than May 15. Then hopefully we'll print and we'll finalize and print the report by June 15. Have it in the hand of the commissioners by then. And then we have another public meeting sometime before the end of July, early August, to say, okay, we're done. Here's what we learned. Here's what we've recommended. Have at it. 